and welcome back to another episode of New Games for Old Computers. <laughs> so uh, what I try to do once or twice each year is to do reviews of some new games that have come out for old computers. In this, uh, in this particular case, these games are all for uh, the Commodore VIC-20 and 64. And um, rather than do a single, like, you know, 20 or 30 minute long episode on a single game, um, I like to do several games in one episode. That way you just kind of get a little bit of an overview of each one. So um, let's get started. These are some of the games I'm going to be showing you today. We've got Le Baie de Mont for the Commodore 64, uh, Fire for the Commodore VIC-20, Realms of Quest 5 for the VIC-20, and Man Cave for the C64. Let's take a look at Realms of Quest 5. I was particularly interested in this one because uh, I was always a big fan of the Ultima series on the Commodore 64, and there was never really any sort of complex role-playing game like this for the VIC-20. Sure, there was a cartridge version of Ultima Escape from Out Drash, but uh, this game was very simplistic, and to be honest, I never really found it entertaining. Ultima gave you a whole world to explore and uh, increasingly difficult battles to fight, and I suspect the reason the VIC-20 never got any games like this is due to the need for more RAM. With 5K of built-in RAM, these sort of games just wouldn't be possible. And since no game developer uh, dared to write a game for the VIC-20 requiring a 32K RAM expander, uh, we just would never see this sort of game done. Until now, of course. Opening the box, we find a manual and two floppy disks. Now, this in and of itself is very unusual because I don't think I've ever seen any VIC-20 games that came on a uh, floppy disk. They were uh, usually distributed on cartridge or cassette tape. Um, next, we get a little coin here of some kind with the name of the game on it. Uh, this is also made of real metal, so it's, it's not plastic. And last but not least, we get a cloth map. And this is very similar to other games of the era. So um, these are some pretty nice physical goodies that come with the game. Looking at the manual, it's quite a substantial manual, quite a few pages. And uh, one of the things I thought was great is that it has the uh, Vic Dude, as I like to call him, which is the little guy that looks like a Vic-20, uh, which was featured heavily in the original user's manual for the Vic-20. So um, it does say it requires 32K of RAM and, of course, a disk drive or two. So first I'll take care of the RAM problem by using my penultimate cartridge, which has a RAM expander option. And according to the manual, the game actually supports dual disk drives. So I can put one disk in here and the other disk in there. And um, However, I may have to flip the disks around to reverse the size throughout the game, but this should reduce uh, disk swapping a lot. Or I can just use a 1581 disk drive instead. Um, although the disk isn't included, the digital download does include an image uh, for one of these disks, which can hold the entire game on a single disk, thus eliminating any disk swapping. However, I'm going to cheat a little bit more than that uh, in that I'm going to copy the game to an SD card and use my SD to IEC to play the game. This is a modern device that plugs into the disk drive port and it also gets its 5 volts power from the cassette port, so I'll plug that in too. Okay, uh, now I'm going to fire up my VIC-20, but since I have the penultimate cartridge installed, I get this screen first and I'll need to go down and select the uh, RAM to be 32K. And now I can load the game. I'll start by looking at the introduction. Uh, this is a nice intro, especially for a VIC-20 game. Uh, it's got music, narration, and these pretty pictures. <laughs> and uh, these intro pictures are actually pretty cool. Uh, the truth is VIC-20 games never included full screen artwork like this. The main reason for that is a full screen of graphics consumes more RAM than the VIC-20 even comes with from the factory. So without a RAM expander, this sort of thing just wasn't possible. Okay, so um, there are some other things on the main menu, um, like the Book of Beasts, so let's have a look. So what this does is give you a list of all of the monsters you might encounter in the game, and um, lets you view information about them. And dang, there are a lot of them here. Um, I'll just have to pick one. Um, here's Ghost. So it tells you a little bit of information about the ghost, and after a moment it'll show you a low resolution picture of one. And uh, I'll pick another one. Here's Gnome. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the settings menu. Uh, so you can change the game speed between fast, slow, or medium, and you can turn the music on or off. And uh, you can select the tiles to be multicolor or high res. And then another interesting feature is font. You can select multiple different fonts to use. Um, this one is probably the easiest to read, but not the coolest to look at. So uh, yeah, we'll leave it on Realms font. And um, then you can select one or two disk drives, but uh, this doesn't apply here since I'm using the SD card version. So, much like any role-playing game, you do have to create several characters. It looks like you can create up to 10, and uh, with each character you can pick all these various things. And then as to be expected, you start with a certain amount of gold, and then you have to buy some weapons. 
And now we're off to explore. The actual playfield area looks very small, however it is 11 by 11 tiles, which is the exact same as Ultima, uh, the only difference is the tiles are much smaller, and I suspect this was done to make room on the screen for all of this uh, other information, uh, being the VIC-20 text mode is only 22 columns. So I went off exploring and was almost immediately attacked multiple times by different creatures. And to be honest, I didn't really know what I was doing as this game is surprisingly complex, and uh, I also must admit being a little disappointed that you don't really get to see the battle from a top-down scene. In Ultima, I could always see exactly who and how many I was fighting, and I could plan my attacks more carefully. Uh, this seemed to leave a lot up to the imagination. In fact, several of my party died pretty quickly before I was even able to find another town to visit. So what do I think about this game? Well. Uh, for me personally, in the year 2019, I think this game is too complex and requires too much of a learning curve for me to really want to get into it. However, I'm sure if this game was released in 1981, that uh, perhaps bundled with a RAM expander in the box, I'm sure it would have sold a million copies. In fact, it might have changed the landscape for the VIC-20 because there would have finally been a killer app that got people to buy a RAM expander, making other games viable that also could use more RAM. The next game I'm going to show real quick is called Fire, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this game because honestly it's not that great. But I do find it interesting due to a similarity it has to another game I do like, and uh, let's see if you can spot it. So you start off with a little map of the city, and there will of course be a fire somewhere, and so you have to plot out the course that the fire truck is going to take to get to the fire. And then you have to actually drive the fire truck down the street, avoiding obstacles. And then once you're there, you have to catch all of the falling people that are jumping out of the building. And that's honestly about all there is to the game. It's about the same quality of game you would have had from a magazine type-in program back in the 80s. Uh, but did you notice the similarity to another game? Well, I think it closely follows the formula for Ghostbusters. Uh, this is the C64 version I'm showing here. Um, so, you know, you have to plot your course and then drive to the location. And then, of course, uh, once you're there, you have to catch the ghost. Um, Anyway, I just thought that was interesting, but uh, we'll move along. Okay, so now it's time to switch gears, and we're going to put away the Commodore VIC-20, and now I'm going to show you some brand new games that just came out for the Commodore 64. Well, let's take a look at uh, La Baie de Mort, which is French and roughly translates to Monastery of the Dead. The first thing I noticed about this is that it comes on a cartridge, which is pretty cool. Um, however, I know it's also available on floppy disk and a digital download for SD card readers. Also included is some sort of ring, which is far too big for any of my fingers. It does have a manual, but it's surprisingly thin. It's only a few pages. And it also includes this fold-out mini poster of the game artwork. I'll go ahead and insert the cartridge into my C64, and let's power it on. So, being a C64 coder myself, uh, the first thing I notice about this game is that it actually runs in character mode. And there's nothing terribly unusual about that, uh, but they're using the high-res characters instead of the multi-color characters. And this means you can only have one color per character, along with the main background color, which in this case is black. Apparently, in this game, you are playing a heretic that's being pursued by the Catholic Church. So yeah, there they come, running after me. Fortunately, there's this uh, abandoned church nearby I can hide in, and <laughs> uh, they keep banging on the door, but I guess they aren't getting in. So you grab these little scrolls, and they have clues you can use uh, later. Uh, this is where I'm really just stunned by the work they've done on the graphics. Uh, each room is like a work of art, and I know firsthand how difficult it is to make nice looking artwork in high-res character mode, uh, since that's what I use for Planet X2. Besides the graphics, uh, the music and sound effects are surprisingly good. I also noticed the music changes depending upon what room you're in, uh, for example, when you look out the window. This is a really cool scene here, I just love this. I also like how every room has a name, which is displayed on the bottom right of the screen. I don't know if I've seen that before. You know what this game uh, reminds me a lot of? Monty on the Run. Not only from a gameplay perspective, but it also used the same graphics mode as well. And uh, This game appears to be a lot more complex, and uh, dare I say better artwork than Monty on the Run though. Um, so now that I ring the bell upstairs, uh, this room now has an opening in the floor I can fall into, and now I can go through this giant underground labyrinth. In some rooms you may have to push down on the joystick so you can crawl under low areas. Now, this room has another one of those clues on a scroll. <laughs> Jump to death and prove your faith. 
Well, from experience I can tell you it doesn't apply to this room, uh, you'll definitely die in this room. Uh, but here in the next room, after you avoid this critter, uh, you can jump down here and you'll fall through where you need to be in the uh, room below. And um, this room has an invisible platform you have to jump on, and so you can get to the switch to open the door below. So a lot of little mysteries to figure out, and um, this game is surprisingly hard. It, it took me quite a while to be able to make it this far, and I don't even know how many levels this game has, but I'm really impressed with this game. It's fun, it uh, has great graphics and great sound, and it's easy to learn. I mean, you don't even need to read the manual to figure it out, so I definitely recommend this one. Okay, next up we're going to have a look at Man Cave. Unfortunately, mine got a crack during shipping, but I think it'll be okay. Now, <laughs> reading the description here, this is quite an unusual game premise. Uh, I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, let's open it up. I think um, this piece of cardboard is just for shipping. Inside, we get a floppy disk, and wow, I like that sleeve. I mean, that's quite elaborate. Of course, um, the warning's on the back. And um, the jewel case insert appears to also double as the user manual if you open it up. This intro screen is bizarre. Even though it's loading from disc, it has an intro that looks like something that would be loaded from cassette, the way the uh, graphics load in slowly like this. Um, I'm going to fast forward so it doesn't take forever. I do like the intro music. It's a very nice melody. Okay, so the premise of this game is that you're a middle-aged man and you just got home from work, and your two kids discovered your collection of pornographic magazines from when you were a teenager, and they have placed them all over the house, and uh, your wife's about to get home and discover them, so you have to collect the magazines and put them back in your man cave. Now that's quite an interesting game idea. So here we are. <laughs> You have to play the balding middle-aged man at the bottom there, who uh, looks surprisingly a lot like me, and uh, he might could pass for Tech Moan as well. Uh, anyway, um, I just collected a magazine, and I have to wait for another one to start flashing somewhere. Now, there are some very weird concepts in this game. First of all, if you run into your kids, you actually die, which makes no sense. <laughs> um, also, the kids run back and forth on a particular level. They can go off the screen to the left and the right, but they never go down the stairs. Your character, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. You cannot go off the edge of the screen, but you can go up and down the stairs. So the goal is to avoid the kids by timing everything just right and getting the magazines. Now, once you've picked up a few, um, you'll have to take them back downstairs and deposit them in the green bucket on the bottom right of the screen. On the bright side, this middle-aged man must be very wealthy as his house has five stories and uh, you haven't even begun to see the rest of it yet. The gameplay reminds me a bit of Donkey Kong, or maybe even Avoid the Noid. So what do I think of it? Well, uh, the game is well polished, and I like the music and the graphics are also well done. I feel it lacks a bit in the gameplay department. Um, I feel like this is a game you're probably going to get tired of playing after about 20 minutes. It reminds me a lot of a Mastertronic game or some other of the budget games of the 1980s, which makes sense because the game is relatively inexpensive and it is available on cassette, disc, or digital downloads. So if you like collecting, it's cheap enough you can say, why not? <laughs> One last little thing about it here, um, I like the Hall of Fame setup. It's uh, a wheel of letters you rotate to pick your initials. And uh, let's see where I end up. Looks like I am taking the uh, number 8 and 9 spot. Um, I have a ways to go to work my way up the list. Anyway, I have one more surprise bonus game to show here. Double -sided Double -sided game. So yeah, this is called Vegetables, and uh, I just got this a few days ago as digital downloads, so I don't have a box to show you. I love the intro artwork and the music. Okay, so um, at the menu here, you can decide whether you want your three SID voices to be for music or for sound effects. This first round, I'll do sound effects. So this is your basic match three game, similar to Bejeweled or Candy Crush. I think everyone knows how to play these. Uh, for joystick implementation, uh, you just select the one you want to move, hold the button down, and pick which direction you want it to go. It's actually pretty fun, and the learning curve is very short, and you can get right into this game quickly. And uh, if you get stuck, it will give you hints as to what to move next. I'll start it over, and we'll um, try using in-game music instead. So yeah, I actually um, I think I prefer the music over the sound effects. So uh, much like Tetris, this is a good game if you just want to relax and veg. <laughs> and that's probably why it's named Vegetables. 
And so that about wraps it up. I was also planning to show this uh, Remute cartridge, which is um, for the Sega Genesis. And it's not so much a game as it is just like a musical album on cartridge. And uh, But it turns out Tecmo just recently did a full video on this. So uh, I thought he did a pretty good job. I don't see any reason to replicate that. So I'll just put a link uh, down in the description for his video. And the next video I'm going to be working on is actually not going to be on this channel. It's going to be on my other channel, 8-Bit Keys. And I'm going to be covering the musical keyboard attachment for the Mattel Intellivision game console. So uh, stick around for that, and um, thanks for watching.